Welcome to the Climax Academy Live. I'm Jim Miller, the Global Training Manager. I really want to thank you for being flexible on our time change, uh, and uh, we really appreciate it. Climax has always been on the forefront of adopting new ways to help customers' problems, and I hope these videos are being helpful to you to, to advance your work. So I want to remind you, though, if you have any questions during the video or at any time during this, uh, this presentation, uh, just go on the bottom of the screen and click the Zoom Q&A, and um, we'll get to those questions at the end. So um, appreciate your participation in that. So let's always start with safety. Um, uh, every time I, uh, I walk up to a, an operation that we're about to do, I always like to do what we call risk, risk assessment. And that's where I'm looking for things that could potentially cause me or others around me uh, hazards. So I really want to watch for uh, cords, uh, cables from the machine. Uh, I really want to look for pinch, potential pinch points that I might run into, any sharp objects. I want to make sure that I wear the proper PPE for running the machine. Um, no rings or watches or anything that might get caught, uh, no ties. Um, and always, if I'm running a machine, I want to make sure I have my ear protection and, and eye protection. I'm not running the machine today, so I'm, I'm safe there. So, um, yeah, any, any sharp objects, chips, tool bits, uh, anything that, might, you know, that I might run into, or anything the machine might run into, because I've got things swinging around here uh, in the demonstration, so I want to make sure I'm away from that uh, safely. So, let's go right into this. Uh, so, why would I need a facing attachment? I mean, that's... That's this unit right here between the bearing and the workpiece. Um, so why I would need that is if I need to make that face perpendicular to the bore. Uh, say this got damaged uh, in use and you know this takes a lot of side pressure uh, and I wanna make sure that this is nice and clean and a certain dimension overall. Uh, because oftentimes I have something else that's gonna pin to this and I wanna make sure that there's a good fit or I've even got you know bushings in between or or, or spacers in between, shims in between. So if I'm gonna weld this up, I definitely wanna pre-cut it because that damage has pushed material into that face. So I wanna pre-cut all that junk off of there, uh, any carbon, any, any dirt that's gotten pounded into the material, get that cleaned up. So then when I do weld, I have a good bond surface to weld to. Um, so then after I weld, I also would wanna use the facing head to cut that. Uh, back to a set dimension. Uh, this particular uh, facing head is designed so that I can place an L-shaped tool bit into here and go into the bore and radially feed to recut or to establish a new snap ring. And oftentimes a snap ring will go in there, so I slide a bushing in and then I put a snap ring or I put a bearing in and I put a snap ring behind it so it can't walk its way out. So that's kind of the basic use that I would that I would want to have this facing, uh, this facing snap ring groove, uh, groove, facing grooving tool. Okay, I stumbled over that. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, remind you one more time. Any questions that uh, you, that come up during the video, feel free to to uh, click on that Zoom Q and A at the bottom and um, and type that question in. And at the end of the video, we will uh, we'll be here live again to answer any of those questions you might. All right, so enjoy the video. Uh, these are the components of the uh, facing and grooving tool. We have the clamp collars. Uh, we have the yoke, which uh, allows the machine to be fed radially. We have the main body of the facing uh, head itself. So how this works is um, we have a, uh, a feed pinion that goes through the center of the mechanism and as I turn these handles it feeds the slide either from the inside out or the outside in. If I have one side engaged uh, and, the, and the mechanism is ac actuated it goes from the inside out. If I have the opposite side engaged and I activate the mechanism it goes from the outside in. I want to make sure that these two adjusting screws are in such a way that when I turn this by hand, I have a slight friction, but it's not loose. I don't want this to be able to play back and forth. If that happens, I'll get a, a rough finish on my 
face when I'm doing the fit facing operation. I want this to be a nice, smooth, uh, easy uh, in and out operation by hand. Okay, so the first, uh, first part of the operation is I want to put the key in the, in the body itself and I want to place the head a, f a fair distance away from the surface that I'm going to face so that I can just assemble the unit onto the bar. So I'll hold this in place, make sure that I have the slot in the right location that give the rack clearance and then I can go ahead and, and just tighten this right onto the bar. Don't drop the wrench. Okay, I want to also, before I tighten this down on the bar, at this point I can still slide this back and forth. I want to make sure that I have an even gap between the clamp and the body. Uh, I don't want to have this tightened all the way over to one side. <clears throat> so I want to make sure this is nice and tight and I want to make sure that this gap is, is pretty well even. Uh, between the cap and the body itself. So I want that good and tight onto there. I want to be able to put the spacer ring between the body and the yoke that I'm going to put on next. That way I can set the amount of distance between the feed mechanism and the clutch itself. So the first thing is I put this collar on and just lightly uh, put pressure on it and I'm not going to tighten that down. So the next component is the yoke mechanism and this is what gives me the ability to feed. As I tighten this mechanism down it cams this out to hit the the feed ball. So the farther this tips out the more feed it has per revolution. So this collar spaces the yoke away from the body and then the second collar holds it from popping away. Okay. So now that I have the body, the spacer collar, the yoke, and the second spacer collar, I need to set the distance that the cam has in relation to the feed trip mechanism. With this collar turned all the way out, and that, that releases the cam to fall back as far as it can go, I want to make sure that when the head goes past the yoke that it's not contacting this feed ball. So at this point with a small gap between the spacer and the body I can that that gives me the ability to feed to zero. I have to be able that when this is turned all the way out the feed mechanism is turned all the way out that it does not contact the, uh, the feed mechanism. Okay, so with that tight, now when I hold this up against there, there's actually a gap between the feed cam and the feed ball. That's very important. I need to be able to go to zero feed, especially if I'm doing a snap ring groove. Okay, so then the second collar then can be set so that there is a minimum amount of clearance. I want this to be free and yet I don't want it to push away. So I want to make sure that the yoke is, is freely rotates as the bar rotates and this second collar keeps the yoke from being pushed away. So to test that I have it set properly, I have the feed engaged so when I turn this it's going to feed in and as the as the head's going to rotate past the yoke it's not contacting at all the the more I the more I advance the cam out it starts to contact the ball the more feed I give it the more it contacts the ball which gives me a greater feed from in to out so now at this setting I can have an, a great advancement on the feed and be able to increase the amount that the tool head is feeding in and out. So that's the proper setting for the head, the spacer, the yoke, and the second spacer. So now I can take this feed to zero and I'm ready to start cutting. Okay, now I'm gonna place the tool bit 
in the facing head, I, uh, I want to be able to start from the inside of the bore and face out. So I'm going to choose which side of the carrier I want to put the tool bit on. This is a number three metric Allen wrench. I can just slide the tool bit up into the tool slot and then reach in here and tighten that tool bit down. So even though the tool is up a long ways away from the workpiece, I'm setting the direction that I want this to, to feed. So then I can just tighten the tool bit down so that it won't move as I feed it out. So now that I've set the tool in the tool carrier, I can advance my feed box to, get the, to bring the tool right up to the edge of the workpiece. And I'm just going to run this up and down so that I know that it's just barely touching the work. Okay. So the tool bit now, is I've just touched the edge of the tool to the face of the work that's going to be cut. So now that I've touched the tool off to the face of the work, I want to set up my dial indicator and know exactly how much I'm feeding the tool into the work. I'm going to set my depth of cut to 10 thousandths to come off the face of the, of the work. After I've set the tool for distance, then I'll remove my dial indicator. So this is the, one of the few times that I ever use this collar on the back of the drive. Now at this point, I want to tighten this collar so that the the feed doesn't have an effect or the bar doesn't slide away from the facing operation. So I want to lock this collar down so that the bar does not slide freely through the drive. At this point I also want to make sure that my feed mechanism is in neutral and both of the feed directions are screwed completely in so that there's zero feed in case I'd accidentally got engaged. So now I want to determine which clutch is the clutch that's going to feed from the inside out. I can engage one side. If I can go the direction I want to go, I'm right. In this case, I'm not. I want to engage the opposite side. So that as the feed mechanism runs out, the, 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 this is the clutch on the opposite side that's going to be feeding. So as this trips, it's going to incrementally feed out. I also want to make sure that the direction of my rotation is the direction that's taking the torque from the torque arm. If this is on the opposite side, when there's torque against it, it'll swing over to this direction. I want to make sure that this is up against here, and as the feed force hits it, it pushes it in against the solid stop. Okay, so now at this point, I'm going to show you how to preset the amount of feed rate before we actually start cutting. Uh, I just took a simple mag base, attached a test indicator to the face of it, and set the tip onto the carrier and set it at zero. I can then manually bring the, the yoke arm up so that the feed cam is, is in contact with the, with the ball on the opposite side. Now instead of rotating the head, I can just rotate the yoke arm past the feed and I can just turn this out until it hits the amount that I see that I want to have every time it strikes. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> lower this down. Barely touch the indicator to zero. So with this setting, Every time the cam goes past the feed mechanism, it advances about five, four to five thousandths. So that's a good amount of feed to start. That's gonna, every time this rotates past the clutch arm, it's gonna advance the tool about four to five thousandths. So now I can remove the, the dial indicator and I'm preset at 10 thousandths depth and four thousandths per revolution of feed. So now that I've preset the entire facing head, the arm, the clutches, I've preset the depth of cut, the amount of feed, the, the torque arm is down against the welded mount. All I, I merely have to do now is, is start the rotation of the, of the boring bar and uh, it will automatically feed at 10 thousandths depth of cut across this face uh, as I turn the machine on.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, so hopefully that was helpful for you. And now that you've watched the video, now we can go into the question and answer portion of our demonstration here. And Jacob's going to help me out with uh, reading the questions as they come in. So what do, we, what do we got for our first question? First question here, Jim, is how do I determine uh, the correct RPM? Okay, that's a good question. So I've got a variety of diameters, potentially, right? Um, so the bore diameter is one, the OD of the snap ring is the other, um, and then the OD of the flange or the face that I'm gonna cut. So if I'm facing, what I really wanna do is I wanna calculate my RPM based on the outside diameter of the face because that's where the tool is gonna be covering the most ground. It's gonna be going the fastest by the material, if, if you will, uh, the, higher, the highest of the surface feet per minute. So uh, what I'll do is I'll make an easy number just so it's easy to remember. I'll go by the, the uh, diameter of the bore. And, um, and the, the formula that I use for that is RPM equals surface feet per minute times four divided by the diameter. So that's the, that's the easiest way to calculate the RPM. So let's just run through the numbers. It, it gets confusing with formulas like that. So uh, if, I have a, if I have a four inch bore, and generally when I'm using high speed steel, I want about, a, about 100 surface feet per minute. If I'm using carbide, I can go up to 300. But in this case, when we're doing a snap ring, it's only 100 surface feet per minute. So um, I want 100 times four, because that's my bore diameter, so that's 400. And then I want to divide that by the diameter, which is four inches. Right, so that's 100 RPM. So it's easy to calculate RPM. I just count the times that this goes by me in 15 seconds, and then times that by four. And that gives me the revolutions in one full minute. I don't want to have to sit there and count it for a full minute. So just little shortcuts there. That formula is very helpful. So RPM equals surface feet per minute times four divided by the diameter. And that'll work on any diameters that you're working with, and any surface feet per minute that you want to throw into that calculation. So, okay, so next question. Do I always need the spacers provided in the kit? That's a good question too. No, uh, I don't have the kit in front of me here, but it comes with little pieces of tubing that are about uh, an inch and a half thick, and they're four inches square, so they match the bolt pattern on the single arm and the double arm mount. Um, in this case, I just put an extension because I have enough room with just a one inch extension. Uh, the, the key really is that I want enough room between the face of the bore and the back of the bearing to be able to accommodate my two uh, slip rings, my yoke, and then the head itself, and then the length of the tool bit. So I just have to have that wide enough so that all that clears and swings within there. Um, uh, so if, if I don't need all that extra spacing, then I prefer not to have it because remember, the, the farther my bearings become apart, the more flexible the bar, just because all metal bends, uh, it's just a function of the closer the bearings, the more rigid it is, the farther the bearings, the more flexibility that is potential there. So that was a, that's a great question. So this one's, uh, what is the swing diameter? So kind of describe what- Define the swing about. diameter. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, so what that means is, that is the overall envelope that the head can swing within. So in this case, this is, a, uh, this is what we call a 12 inch facing head. So it needs 12 inches to swing comfortably. Now what, what you'll run into on some is when you have an ear on a setup like this, um, oftentimes the distance from the center line of the bore is less or can be less than what you can fully swing. So that's, what, that's why that matters. That's why that swing diameter matters. In this case, I'm outside the board and I can use this single arm with my spacer setup. So as long as I have more than six inches from the center line of the bar, 
down to where the tack plate is welded on, I'm, I'm fine. But, but that's what that swing diameter means. It's that minimum envelope that that facing head can swing with inside that. So uh, for the facing attachment, can you use the same tools that you use when you're boring? So the high speed steel while you're boring, can you use that in the facing head? Yes, yes you can. Um, now the kit will come with a variety of lengths of tools. And um, you know, with the bar, I've got a two and a quarter bar and then I've got a diameter outside of the bar or I've got a facing head that, or a boring head that's outside that diameter. So the overall length of the longest tool is four inches. Well, I can't use that tool in here because that's just too far of a lever arm. I'm only, got, I'm only hanging on to it with two set screws uh, in this slot. So I wanna pick the shorter of the tools, probably the one inch or maybe the 1.8 is as long as I'd wanna go uh, and still be able to hang on to it in this tool slide and reach out. Um, yeah, that's the, 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 the the, the, the bad thing is that people want to put a long tool and get way away from this, and, and that just puts so much momentum on those two little set screws that it'll pull it right out of the facing head. So you don't want to go too long with that tool bit. But the material-wise, they're fine. High-speed steel or carbide, phrase carbide, either one work great. So this one's in regards to the ranges, the facing ranges. So what are the ranges that are available for this facing tool? And are there options available for larger bo uh, bars, maybe smaller bars as well? Yeah, no, good question. Um, you tested me on my, on my data re retention here. So the, uh, there's, there's actually a smaller version of this for the inch and three quarter bar. Um, and, and I believe that one goes from two and a half to 12. And then, um, and then this one uh, also goes from two and a half to 12. They, we also have a, a 19 inch model, that, uh, or 20 inch model that swings within a, uh, swings within a 19 inch envelope uh, that'll, that'll go onto the two and a quarter bar. Now when we go to the small bore kit on this particular machine with the inch and a quarter, uh, then we go down to the uh, dual lead screw uh, facing head that goes onto the inch and a quarter and it'll, it'll go on either the inch and a quarter or the uh, two and a quarter. And then we also have a large facing head, the heavy duty facing head, facing head that goes clear out to 24 inches. I believe the minimum swing on that 17 inches, if I, if I remember correct, that it has to have a minimum of 17 inches to swing in the swing diameter, but then it's a, got an adjustable arm that allows it to be uh, set out to cover that 24 inch uh, diameter. It also has a little different feed system. Rather than the clutch being built right in uh, to the main body of the, of the uh, facing uh, arm, it has a feed box that goes on the end of the arm. And so it's set up a little bit differently, but uh, it's also a much more rigid uh, uh, facing head for, for those larger diameters. So hopefully, hopefully that answers you. So this is kind of a similar question, just a little bit of clarification. So when you use the small bore kit, this is something that you can use applicable for that as well. Not this particular uh, part number. Uh, when you're using the small bore kit, um, if you're using the inch and a quarter small bore kit, you have to use the dual lead screw or the universal, what we call a universal facing head. It has two lead screws and a tool slide that, that slides away from that for the inch and a quarter. There's one very similar to this, it looks like down a little this for the inch and three quarter small bore kit. Um, but, but again, it, it only has an inch and, a, inch and three quarter diameter where this is a two and a quarter diameter that it pulls to. So, so yeah, the inch and a quarter is different from the inch and three quarter and the two and a quarter. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. So this one's in regards to cutting snap ring grooves. Um, about what's the depth you can get with that so how yeah so the tool bit itself is an inch and three quarter long and i want to hold on to about a half inch of it so that's about you know that's about a half an inch three eighths of an inch that i can reach into the board um and, and remember you you really don't want to you don't really want to extend a tool out too far away and generally uh the snap rings are right out at the end of the board anyway uh, normally, you don't see a snap ring that's clear down inside of a bore. Uh, that's just that's just not how they usually function. Usually, there's only hundred thousandths 
from the face in uh, because they want to just be able to slide that bearing in and then put that snap ring just to retain the bearing so they can't slide back out or push them to slide back out. So most equipment is designed to have the snap ring right out at the very edge of the face. So it's never been an issue really uh, to have to reach in. Now, that being said, we do offer a kit of adjustable um, tools and inserts that, that you can modify the grooving tool to get a little bit farther in, uh, but you'll have to contact your uh, area sales manager to get the details on that, that tooling kit, that adjustable range tooling kit. So, great questions today. Uh, hopefully this, this really was helpful to you and it'll make your work more efficient. And uh, we really appreciate you tuning in. And again, we appreciate your flexibility on the time. So if you have any further questions after this uh, session is through, uh, please feel free. Oh, I guess we got another one. We got one right here, Jim. Uh, do all the motors that we provide, do those have enough torque or is there any restrictions for that when using the face head? Yeah, boy, that's a pretty open-end question. Um, I, my, my, my initial answer is no, um, because, and this is why. Because we, we offer a wide range of motor options. Uh, this this Ibenstock motor is great for the full range because it has a four-speed gearbox. It can go very slow for the big diameters and it can go reasonably fast for the smaller. But if you uh, start talking about hydraulic motors, uh, we make some pretty fast hydraulic motors like a 2.6. And that's gonna be very, it's gonna have a high RPM but it's gonna have a very low torque. And what that means is if I try to slow it down to the range that I want the surface speed per minute, like we talked about in that first question, if I want to slow that RPM down with a fast or a, high, a, a fast motor, it's going to want to stall out. So that motor is not really very good. Once you get, start getting up into the 7.3s or the 14.2s, the, the, the bigger motors with the higher displacement, then I can run a low RPM with a high torque. And that's really what I want when I'm doing snap ring groups. I want to be able to run a, a, a relatively low RPM, a fairly low feed rate, and I just want to bump that tool out a little bit at a time. Kind of think about a snap ring operation as a parting tool on a lathe. I'm not just going to crank that tool in and let it part that piece off. I'm going to feed it in a little bit, let it kind of catch up, clear the chips, give it a little bit more, give it a little bit more. That's how I'm going to want to try to operate this facing grooving uh, when I'm doing a groove. I want to just let it feed a little bit and then let it catch up, let it feed a little bit and then it catch up. Now if I'm facing, no problem, just set the feed rate like, like we demonstrated and, and let it face across there. But um, hopefully that answers your questions. We've got such a wide variety of motors, it's difficult to say yes to a question like that because there, there is so many options there. But, but again, great questions again. And uh, if you think of one after this is over, fee, uh, feel free to uh, submit it to askcpmt at cpmt.com. All right. Thanks again for joining and look forward to seeing you next time.